ಇತಿಪಿಸೋ ಬದೇವಾ ಅರೇಹ ಸಂಬುಧೋ ವಿಧ್ಯಾಚರಣ ಸಂಪನ್ನೋ ಸುಗತೋಕವಿದು ಅನುತ್ತರು ಪುರಿಷದಮಸಾರತಿ ಸತ್ತೇವ ಮನೋಸ್ಥಾನ Namaste. So, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so grateful to have the facility to be able to present this great knowledge from the original scriptures. Uh, no middleman. <laughs> no salesman will call. <laughs> no ads. No organization. no hassles no structures no rules this is real knowledge so today we're talking again from the maha satipatthana sutta and this time we move on to the next topic after mindfulness of breath to mindfulness of posture So what is it about mindfulness of posture? Let's see what the Buddha says. Monks, when moving, a monk understands, I am moving. When standing, one understands, I am standing. When sitting, one understands, I am sitting. When reclining, one understands, I am reclining. or in whatever way the body is positioned one understands it as it is in this way one abides dedicated completely aware and mindful without covetousness or depression about the world observing the body as the body so here again there's a lot that is unsaid which is just as important if not more important than what is said this is the buddha's style it's called apophysis the apophatic style where what remains unsaid is just as important as what is said so what does he say basically when you're walking sitting standing or reclining just walk sit stand or recline don't think about it don't make up stories about it don't assign designations to it or values or you know any other kind of extra added information just be with your body posture as it is in the moment So this is very wonderful. In addition to being mindful of breath, one should also be mindful of one's posture, whatever it is. And what does this do? This is called fabrication of the body. There's another sutta uh, about fabrication where Buddha says there are four kinds of fabrication. fabrication of the mind of the body of feelings and of action and fabrication of the body he says is breathing in and out so by breathing in and out we're creating the body if you want to test this just stop breathing for a couple of minutes <laughs> you feel like you're going to die right because you are <laughs> if we can't breathe for a like 3 or 4 minutes only then we're finished the brain goes into shutdown and we're clinically dead so by breathing we are fabricating the body we are creating the body actually so this is a very important insight and similarly by being mindful of posture we are creating the body in that posture now in buddhist culture walking is very important 
Because if you're sitting for long periods of meditation, you have to get up and stretch your legs every hour or so. So in Buddhist monasteries, there are meditation huts, special little house structures that you can sit in and meditate. And just in front of them, there are walkways made usually of sand. Like they have two curbs, one on each side, and in the middle is filled in with sand. And so when you need to stretch your legs after a long sail, you get up and walk up and down, still meditating, still being mindful of the breath and the posture. And you just walk up and down this little sand runway, walkway, until your legs, you know, stretch out. Then you sit back down. The Buddha is into wakefulness. He's into staying awake as much as possible. So he's going to arrange things so that he can meditate in any of these four postures, sitting, walking, standing, or lying down. Meditation means mindfulness. It doesn't mean some form of abstraction. It means just seeing what is there and not seeing what is not there. <laughs> In other words, not hallucinating or fabricating anything beyond what is. This is a very important discipline. And in this sutta, the Buddha shows how to apply it to all different aspects of life. So I should have done this earlier, but I want to show the outline of this section of the sutta. Mindfulness of the body is divided into six sections. Mindfulness of breath, mindfulness of the four postures, complete awareness, mindfulness of bodily components, mindfulness of elements, and mindfulness of bodily decomposition. So we're going to go through these six sections one by one. And in each one, we'll see that the whole thrust or the whole intention of the sutta is to be aware of the body without identification with the body, without thinking that the body is myself or even that the body is mine. Because at the end, the body is going to be finished. It's going to decompose into its component elements. And these are going to get recycled by nature into many other forms, both animate and inanimate. So this is the destination of the body. We shouldn't think that this body is me, myself, or even mine. Because did we make it? Huh? Did we create this body? So if we didn't create it, how can we say that it's mine? We were given this body by higher authorities, powers of nature. We can personify those powers as gods and goddesses if we want. We can make metaphors about those powers. But the fact is those powers are inconceivable to human intelligence. So the construction of the body is a chintya, it's unknowable, inconceivable. Scientists, huh? those poor pathetic creatures, <laughs> are trying to understand how the body is created without a creator. That's so foolish. It's like trying to understand this, this camera, thinking that, oh, it just happened by chance. <laughs> No, man. Steve Jobs and a bunch of other really smart people sat down and designed it, created it, manufactured it, distributed it, sold it. And so this is a, a smartphone used as a camera 
but it also does many other things. It replaces so many other tools, including a compass and so a timer, a calendar, you name it, weather report, television. Is that going to happen by chance? Scientists are into using very sophisticated measuring devices to test their theories. <laughs> but do those measuring devices just grow on trees? <laughs> no, they're designed and built and tested and certified by people who know what they're doing. Similarly, nature arises from the intelligence of powers that are greater than human. There's simply no other explanation that makes sense. It's the result of an intelligence of power greater than we can even conceive. I mean, look at the recent discoveries in astronomy that there are uh, filaments of gas and stars and even galaxies connecting huge galaxy clusters in a network that looks very much like the neurons in the human brain. What a coincidence. <laughs> it's no coincidence. It's intelligence. So the structure that creates intelligence on the human scale and the structure that creates intelligence on a pan-galactic scale has a similar structure. Who would have thunk it? So we have to understand and accept that this creation, which appears to arise spontaneously, is actually the creation of the goddess. <laughs> there goes the temple bells. This is a very important thing. It's not that Buddha denied the existence of God. It's that he thought that the existence of God is simply irrelevant to our self-realization at the stage of Raja Yoga, Vivartavada. Because why? Once we have accrued sufficient good karma to have no distractions, no obligations, no interruptions, so that we can actually meditate effectively, once we have reached that stage, we are actually on a similar platform of existence as the gods and goddesses. So we don't need to worship them anymore at that point. Although it's optional, it's, it's still nice, you know, if we want to do it. We don't actually see in the Buddha's teaching anywhere where he says those gods and goddesses don't exist. All he's really saying is we don't need to think about them. Right now we need to meditate. This is Vivartavada. This is Raja Yoga. And when Raja Yoga is complete, then we realize that all these arisings of form, whether they be gods, goddesses, galaxies, huh, or microbes, <laughs> tiny cells, or even viruses or molecules, down to the quarks and leptons, are simply thoughts. Thoughts of an intelligence infinitely greater than human. So how do we come to this conclusion? By mindfulness, by observation. Not just observation, but sympathetic observation. Trying to enter in and be compassionate towards the things we observe. And on the other hand, not making up stories about them to fit our small-minded preconceptions. This is the real purpose of mindfulness. Uh, mindfulness, sati. 
This is the real intelligence that leads us to complete self-realization. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.